Greg Berg is a dear friend and one of my favorite people. He has built an independent Power BI consulting business helping multiple industries, but recently has been focused on helping specialty coffee companies. In this show, I got a chance to talk to Greg about some of the challenges facing that industry. Supply chain disruptions, retaining customers, on-time delivery, and more. And how Greg was able to help them with Power BI. We also talked about Greg's life, living in the beautiful British Columbia with his family. And most importantly, the journey that Greg took to create this life and his independent business. So make sure to listen to the end. And I'll come back after the interview to share my biggest aha moment from our conversation. And of course, would love to hear yours. Greg Berg is based out of British Columbia, Canada, where he runs Big Wave BI. You can find Greg on LinkedIn or his website. We'll include both the links in the show notes below. Let's hear from Greg. Welcome to the Power On Show, where we talk Power BI and beyond, sometimes way beyond. But our goal is always to help you create a successful Power BI career and a life of freedom. I'm your host, Avi Singh. Hey, Greg, how are you doing today? Good. How's it going, Avi? Really good. Really good. How's, uh, how's life in British Columbia? Things are good. We just uh, had a bit of snow today and just came through a lot of rain and some flooding over the last few weeks. So uh, I think we're in a little better, better shape now. Boy, you, you were, were, you, were you guys trapped in your homes for a brief while? We actually were. Um, they, they opened up a highway, so trucks were starting to get through, but people were starting to uh, line up outside of the grocery stores and food. We had food shortages there for a little bit. And um, yeah, we, oh, we were, you know, I, I work at home anyways, so it wasn't a huge change for me. But uh, yeah, our, our little town here of Chilliwack, yeah, um, yeah. we couldn't really get out. So yeah, but the joys of living, living among nature, I guess. That's great. That's great. You awesome. bet. So, hey, um, I know you have uh, had an extensive background in aerospace manufacturing. And of course, uh, since starting on your Power BI consulting journey, you've helped lots of different companies in various industries. But boy, there's something special going on with specialty coffee. Uh, let's start at the beginning there. So tell us about how you got started in the specialty coffee industry with Power BI. You bet. So this would have been right before COVID hit. I was starting to work with, it was actually through a, a real Power BI client through, nice. through your initiative, a client called uh, Clifton Coffee Roasters. It was kind of interesting. I, I got a hold of Josh, who was uh, my client. You know, I'd sent him a few emails and couldn't get a hold of him. And uh, I was about to move on. And lo and behold, he had just had a um, their second child and was just coming off paternity leave. And so he he got back to me just at the last minute and he was super excited to work with me and uh, get started with Power BI. From his perspective, they just came off the back of a Microsoft Teams implementation and a showcase with uh, through Microsoft. Actually, um, there's a showcase on their or, or a case study on their website showcasing Clifton Coffee. And I think it was one of the producers that worked with Josh that had introduced him to the idea of Power BI. He had never heard of it. Yeah, he just wasn't sure what to do with it. He 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 didn't at first he was thinking they didn't really have much data. But as he got <laughs> thinking about it, um definitely he started to realize and, and look into it and, and see the potential. And so that's about when I got on board with him. And we started um looking at some Excel exports from their systems. Yeah, it was really cool. Just starting to see it in one place for the first time. Nice. Man, I'm cracking up because <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at like my company. Uh, it's way smaller than Clifton Coffee. Clifton Coffee is, is, is you know, yeah, yeah, big enough. And um, and I, I have tons of data. So <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I, I think that's the day and age we live in, right? I mean, small company, big company, whatever industry you're in, doesn't matter. Everybody has data. Uh, so how was it personally for you stepping into, you know, so... Obviously, there are commonalities. In some sense, data is always data, right? I mean, I, I know how to make sense of kind of the data table, lookup table, all the Power BI stuff that we do, right? But whenever you do step in a new industry, there is always 
maybe even fear or there's an unknown. How, tell me a bit about that. Sure. Um, so my background is is in aerospace manufacturing, like you mentioned, and uh, you know my training was as a mechanical engineer and mm. um, just spent many years as a project manager. And in that role, we touched several aspects of you know the business. We we did a fair bit of purchasing, managing supply chain, and um, just a lot of deadlines and, and managing costs. So yeah. it was those items there that you know there was some definitely some commonality around the two different industries, even though coffee isn't necessarily manufacturing, I guess, but there's definitely some overlap. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, definitely some overlaps. I'd say, you know, one of the areas we looked pretty hard at was um, the roastery and just the, you know, they're storing different coffee uh, beans and and just getting a handle on their inventory and, and just helping them understand what levels any given customer or ordering and just the buying trends there. Yeah. Um, so definitely some overlap, I'd say. Yeah. You know, what I will say is that uh, talking to Josh, he is so inspirational. So uh, what I felt like was if, if Josh is a representation of people in that industry, uh, for me, he is, that there is a lot more passion involved in what they're doing. You know, so I'm thinking about aerospace manufacturing. <laughs> I'm sure there are people that are passionate about it, right? But I don't know, with Josh, it seemed like they were really focused on not just kind of fine tuning the operations, but also, you know, kind of enabling the kind of the roasting process to, as an example, to, to how can we create the best flavor? Mm. Did, did you kind of feel that or see that? Did, did, did that come out as, as a different kind of a uh, was that different than maybe aerospace manufacturing or yeah how did you see that kind of how they felt about their own industry their own work yeah so i'd say i've definitely noticed that um it seems that you know they are really passionate about exactly what you said like the roasting um just getting a a perfect roast especially in in the area of especially coffee there's just a higher level of quality involved and um just where they source the the beans and there's just a real art to it uh yeah. you know it's interesting with with covid you know i haven't actually been able to meet a lot of my clients i've gotten to know the local coffee roasters mm -hmm. and it's been interesting the same story here i've gotten to know one fellow that's just started up a roastery and he said you know even with the little bit that he's learned he said he could spend a lifetime just learning wow. just the art of roasting. So there's just a lot to learn to it. And it just seems like that's where the passion lies. Just, you know, even just sitting down and having a coffee and just, you know, I've, oh, it's that. been very magnetic. Like I've been really attracted to personalities in the industry and what yeah. I've seen so far. Man, I, I love that. I think I can relate to that. And again, you know, so one of the biggest questions that I get, most common questions is like, Avi, when will I be like, good in power bi i want to be a pro i want to be an expert and and i think that's not the right way to look at things right i mean i see i see as you're talking about this person like hey this is this is take a lifetime and of course uh, i'm a huge fan of simon sinek who talks about the infinite game and even if you think about like um, i don't know playing a musical instrument like violin i mean there's no finish line but we just keep getting better and better and it's so fun to kind of be on that journey so that's great. So, so let's uh, talk, talk about roasting. Let's go a little bit deeper. So I'm trying to recall my conversations with you and Josh, and it used to be a bit nightmarish where the person or the team who's in charge of roasting that day, they have to, there's some demand, there's some orders that have been placed and they have to kind of roast those batches, but they have to do it in the right order. They have to have the right materials and during all this, they're trying to optimize the best flavor, get the best roast possible. And it was all managed um, from the impression that I got was it, it was a bit of duct tape and Band-Aid initially. So tell me a bit about before and after, like how it was and what, were you, what were your, uh, you were able to get it up to with the uh, RVI. Sure. So, you know, even as part of their team's uh, implementation, you know, there, there were still a lot of manual um you know paper processes mm -hmm. in place and you know i would say the just coming up with the rose plan for the day what i learned was that they would gather up invoices so some would come in that morning orders would come in from particular customers they'd have orders from the previous day orders coming through not just over the phone but um, they have a subscription model so 
they could get subscription orders in. So it was a bit of a, um, you know, a puzzle to put together every day is how I, I saw it. And, you know, I think they had a cut off at around 10 o'clock in the morning and just gather like physical copies of the invoices and just figure out what they had to roast. And to optimize batches becomes a real challenge because you're really just looking, you know, just right in front of you. You're not really yeah. looking ahead um, a couple of days in a row. Generally, they had a sense of which customers or which, you know, which blends or, or um, single origin roasts that they wanted to do or what, what would be a typical week. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's quite a, quite a bit of variation in there. So they couldn't really get it down to the daily production level. Wow. Just managing it that way. Great. And, and what kind of reports did you guys end up creating for them? Yeah. So one of the key reports would have been for the roastery. Um, we were able to pull the data from Sage 50, which they were using as more than an accounting system, but I would say also to manage their inventory and, and ordering and almost like an ERP system. And so we pulled the data out of Sage and that gave us the ability to see just the, you know, the amount any given client or customer was ordering on a weekly basis. And so you could definitely do some predictive analysis from that. And then we also built a tool that connected up with Sage would give them their sales and then their inventory levels were tracked in this software called Cropster, which mm -hmm. is a fairly um, commonly used software yeah. in the industry, right? Yeah. And yeah. so their inventory data was in there and we put together a report where we could see the inventory levels and the sales levels side by side. Yeah. And, um, you know, built a, a kind of cool what if analysis type tool where we took their batch size, each, each um, profile had a optimal batch size. So we would increment it by that batch size and be able to yeah. I develop a roast plan for the day using that tool. Yeah. Love, love that, man. And, and, you know, I know <laughs> you're probably hanging around with Josh and you feel like, oh, I don't know. I don't know this industry enough. Well, I guess nobody would ever know as, as good as Josh, but man, I, it's lovely to hear you speak that lingo. And, and clearly you've, you worked in the trenches with them, solved these problems with them. And, and of course uh, you shared the, uh, the dashboards in the Barbie conference. And I remember Josh talked about it as the back to the future report. I mean, it was nothing short of science fiction for them. I mean, it was bringing in data, which they had never seen together. They never had availability to. Well, on that report, so let me ask, man, for one thing in the conference, you showed those reports and they were visually so stunning. And, and, and of course the rookie mistake that I see with dashboards is, and for me, that's a classic sign of amateur, is those gaudy, flashy, bright dashboards got with like gauges or something and things floating with shadows and so forth. And I think that's very amateurish that that person doesn't know even the basics of visualization design and just, yeah, just shiny object syndrome. But yours are elegant, tasteful, and of course, very, very functional because uh, your client had, had a lot of great things to say about that. How did you get there? How did you develop that aesthetic? I, I suppose it happened over time. T tell me a bit about that journey. Yeah, I would definitely say it's been a journey. Um, you know, I, it's hard to open some of the dashboards that I built, say, five or six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rough. Um, you know, I would say those ones were more or less using out-of-the-box visuals, not much customization at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a few things along the way. I'd say, you know, one of the things you've taught me is kind of uh, treating color as kind of expensive or whatever. Use it yeah, sparingly. Yeah. <laughs> Use color sparingly on your reports. Um, there's a few people, definitely a lot of credit to the Power BI community. I mean, just there's mm -hmm. been so many people that have, you know, I keep a collection. Anytime I see something I really like, I take a screen grab and, and sort of kind of refer back to it and just see if I could model something after a report that I've seen. Yeah. So I know Reed Havens has a really great tutorial on, I think it's transforming from good to great, something yeah. like that. Yeah. He, yeah. He that's great work. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I mean, we have so many great examples. Of course, uh, Grace Theo, her, her presentation at the last conference, <laughs> man, it just blew all of us away. All right. So, um, so tell me a little bit more, let's say in the coffee industry for a bit more, tell me about some of the other challenges, which 
maybe you had seen before in aerospace manufacturing, maybe they were new. So I've heard about like supply chain. So of course, well, many companies and have supply chain. Is there something unique about the supply chain in the copy industry? I don't know how long it spreads geographically or other things like that. Yeah, I'd say, you know, I'll be honest, I, I'm just getting to understand some of the issues that I'm, I'm hearing. You know, I've heard multiple times it's a fairly complex supply chain. The, one of the unique things maybe about coffee is that there's not really mass production of it. It's, it's a lot of micro mm-hmm. lots, they call it. Yeah. And so there's a lot of talk about traceability and transparency, trying to just tie the coffee back to the source and just understand sort of the story, yeah. for the yeah. journey where it came from. As far as supply chain issues, yeah, obviously this year we've had transportation issues, logistical issues in the ports. You know, coffee can only... You know, I'm not sure exactly how long it can stay before it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you yeah. know, losing its taste or, or flavor. But I know there have, I've heard and read reports about that type of thing becoming an issue as well. Great. So, great. so, so what I love about BI is it always feels like beating that onion, right? And, that, and for me, it's an un- endless onion, right? I mean, you're never done. You do one thing and then you have to, uh, you say, oh, what about this? What about that? So where are you uh, at this point with uh, working with Josh and cooking coffee? What are the kind of the next things, uh, next set of things you're looking at uh, from Power BI perspective? Yeah, so we've discussed a few, a few things. Um, you know, some of the production reports have been used for a while now. So there's some improvements that we've talked about implementing. There's, yeah, some really interesting ones in the industry. They... Um, water filters um, that are used on espresso machines. Currently, at least I'm not aware of any that are fully automated in terms of um, with IoT or or whatnot. For Clifton, they go in and service these espresso machines and it's in the best interest of the customer to replace these water filters on, you know, before they hit their, uh, whatever it is, maybe a thousand liters or whatever. That, that's the max usage a water filter can have. So the system we put in place is using Microsoft Forms. The service tech will log the amount of liters remaining on the filter every time they go visit that client. Yeah. And uh, we, we built a Power BI report that, you know, does some predictive analysis and determines when that reports or when that filter is right. going to need replacing. And so Clifton can stay on top of their ordering that way. So I think there's some refinements that we could do there. Another interesting so, one. So for that one, just a quick question. So I'm imagining the, the tech on site can just use that form and enter data just through their mobile device or whatever, right? I mean, probably their cell phone. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, that's so, terrific. That's terrific. I, I can see how that would really change things. Cool. Cool. What's the next one you were talking about? Yeah. So the next one um, is a lot of their suppliers have seen the work we've done because Josh is able to pull up really quick. You know, he's mentioned in the past that they have a, a better handle on their data than some of their suppliers do. And one of the suppliers in particular has asked for a dashboard to be made for just their products. It sounded like they lost a contract. I guess it was a fairly significant contract um, just because they were out of stock on the particular item that that was needed. And so in order for that not to happen again, they want to build a report to track basically uh, the usage of their raw materials, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, and, and I feel that's the thing, right? I mean, data, or if you have a good handle on data, if you're data savvy, as I like to say, it just gives you an edge in business. I mean, in every aspect of the business, I mean, production, operations, customer satisfaction, whatever, delivery service, it just gives you that edge. And that can mean everything. Totally. Yeah. Great, great, great. So, so what do you see? So I know you kind of exploring. So is, I always say when people are thinking about like becoming a consultant or something, and they have done some good work in the company inside their own company, I always say that, Hey, look, if you help your own company, if you write them and help people around you, then you can do it for others too, right? So is there a possibility that now you've worked with Cliff and & Coffee and you talked about these tools, Cropster, you said, is a pretty dominant software in the specialty coffee. A lot of other companies are using it. Would it be kind of a possible outcome that you start helping other coffee companies who are also using Cropster and 
maybe you and Sage and have some of the similar needs. Is, is that something can, you're looking at? Yeah, hundred percent. I, you know, there's a lot of, I've got a lot of irons in the fire with respect to that, you know, talking to Cropster directly um, about doing some work together, talking to several other roasteries and, and even green coffee traders. So there's a lot of interest. Mm-hmm. It's still early days for me, just as far as breaking into the industry, but um, yeah, a lot of interesting ha- things happening. I would say, I, I think just my impression is that um, there it may not be the first thing they're thinking about is their data, but I know yeah. with these larger roasteries, there's definitely, there, there's definitely some out there that are thinking lean and thinking optimization and, and that's where Power BI really help. So. Love it. Yeah. I think, and of course, inside, you know, kind of our community, we always talk about that challenge, right? Where, where some people are kind of um, ready for the solution and others are not. And, and I don't know, sometimes I feel like uh, I want to focus on the people who are ready for the solution because you, know, you have to fight a little less. But then, of course, I hear people who, or, or I talk to companies and uh, common excuse or thing I would say, oh, we're too busy. And I'm like, oh my God, you, you're too busy bailing water out of your boat, right? And you won't let me fix the leaks in the boat. So anyway, but but yeah, it is what it is. But um yeah, I, I think that does sound promising to so the companies which are aware that, oh boy, there's this new wave coming and yeah, we, we can just gain that edge again by jumping on it. Terrific. Hey, uh, let's just talk about Josh a little bit. So, you know, so seeing you and Josh present at the conference and of course, hearing from both of you, talking to both of you, I can see that it's been a great relationship. And and I always thought about, so of course, inside our consultant program, we're coaching consultants, but a big part of that is the client as well what's been helpful or made it easier for you to kind of deliver value deliver the work what's made it easy for you to work with josh on glyphon coffee project it's it's been great from the get-go i'd say as far as working together i think he really bought in from the beginning and and was of the same mindset as far as working in an agile way right off the bat he did gather the troops on his end and, and figure out what are the basic needs. And, and we fleshed out, you know, some high level ideas as far as what he wanted to accomplish. Yeah. But as we got into it, definitely, you know, we, we saw that there's different directions that could go. And, and we were, I think we we're having at least weekly meetings or maybe even twice a week at some, at times. And I think, yeah, just even though we're in two different time zones and, and just across the world, it's just been really easy to work with him and and uh, just a pleasure were there kind of pockets of resistance within the company that you guys had to work through i mean i don't know maybe some people were not on board or yeah I, you know i'm not as close to it as he is but um definitely you know within you know within their group there was different levels of uptake i'd say i had the opportunity to present it at uh one of the board meetings, maybe one or two times. And I think one lesson learned, you know, we had gone a fair ways into the project and, and presented it. And so as with any dashboard, sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming when you see a bunch of yeah. different uh, reports and you haven't been involved with it. So I think, you know, I could see that that I could have, I uh, could have done things differently there, but um, yeah. yeah, as far as resistance, um, I've seen this before and, and, uh, I think down in, in the roastery, just having heard from Josh, I think, you know, the fellow head roaster there, like just a really detail oriented guy and just probably used to working things out really manually. It took a bit of convincing, but from what I've heard, like just the way Josh has been able to regularly pull up the data and just come up with the same numbers as he would the manual way. I think he's one of the most bought in guys like, um, From what I'm seeing, yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, you're right. And I remember that story. Yeah. Um, that's an incredible one. It, it's, yeah, it's always so heartwarming when you see that turnaround. In, in fact, so of course, it's it's easy when you show a report and people go, whoa, this is amazing. But in some ways, the kind of hard fought wins, they count the most where somebody's kind of resistant and like, oh, well, yeah, what is this thing, right? And they're a little bit skeptical. And then you see them turn it on. Oh boy, that's great. That's great. Awesome. Hey, let's switch gears a bit. Uh, tell me about life in, in Chilliwack, British Columbia. For sure. Um, so life right now, yeah, as I mentioned, we're pretty locked in right now, but you know, it's a beautiful spot. It's uh, an hour away from Vancouver. We've got, you know, world-class fishing. 
uh, about 15 minute walk from my house. It's, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I haven't gone fishing for quite a few years. I've taken my son a few times, but um, we've got that. Um, we tend to go camping or um, during the summer, we're, we're usually out on a hike or walk somewhere close by and there's just infinite number of spots to explore. So it's a beautiful spot surrounded by mountains, a lot of farmland. So they call it the city within the country out here. Oh, and, and you have an RV as well. You, you, you travel around on that as well. We do. Yeah. Um, haven't done as much in the past few years. We, we did a few years ago, right in between selling houses. We actually were living in the RV for a few months and um, actually journeyed down to Seattle, past your place and down to Oregon for a while. And then we realized uh, we have to buy a house. So it was pretty hard <laughs> to, to go to showings when we were down in Oregon. So we booked it back up and uh, yeah. So, you know, ever since then, I, you know, we've made trips out to Banff area in, in Alberta and um, yeah. yeah, explored the okay. province. Love it. So I know you were based out of Vancouver. What does it mean to you to have that flexibility to essentially be able to work from anywhere? And of course, right now you're choosing to be in the beautiful Chiliwack area. But what, is, what does that mean for you, that ability to choose where you work from? Oh, it's huge. I've always had a fairly long commute whether I was heading east or west. I used to live in, in North Delta and commuted about 45 minutes to work. And then we moved out to Chilliwack and, and drove 45 minutes in the other direction. So yeah, I think it's just that time kind of captured back. As far as flexibility, I can, I can work the hours that work for me more or less. Um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be super early in the morning or sometimes late at night, that tends to be pretty productive times for me. So the flexibility has been really great. Yeah. And, and that means you can be around for the kids, uh, I don't know, ice hockey games and stuff, is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm on the ice <laughs> Wednesday afternoons. You you won't find me at the computer. Uh, most Wednesdays, I'm usually on the ice with, with my uh, both of my sons, actually. So that's been a blast. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Great. So let's uh, talk about how did you how did you find Power BI? How did I find it? Yeah. In the it beginning? Was Yep. All the way yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was working in aerospace manufacturing. I was a project manager at the time and, you know, the company was quite small and as a PM, we wore a lot of different hats. And so there was never enough time in the day, you know, and one of our big responsibilities was to report out on the project status to the key stakeholders within the company. And so it was right around that time when Power Pivot was coming out and Power Query, and I was searching online just how to build a dashboard. Like, you know, Excel was kind of the tool that I used and I loved it. I, you know, I was, I learned uh, how to program in VBA from a, a colleague yeah. earlier on and just couldn't believe what he had put together. Um, and so anyway, um, just working with Excel and trying to figure out how to pull together different data sets. So we had an operation in Sweden and Texas and up here in the Vancouver area. And so, as you can imagine, our, our budget, our materials were in U S dollars, um, Swedish dollars and, um, you know, Canadian dollars. So we had to do the conversion every time and exports from different systems. So it was just a bit of a nightmare and it, you can imagine four or five of us running projects maybe eight to 10 projects each. It was just a lot of work to pull this together. And that's when Power BI came on the scenes. Obviously, um, early days, it was not a standalone product, but it was in Excel and it was just perfect timing. It was, it was exactly when I was starting to look for a tool like that to build reports that I could automate the back end, like basically pull from different data sources. That's awesome, man. So, hey, I know it's been quite a journey for you yeah. to kind of start there and be where you are right now. Now I know, uh, having gone through this stuff myself, that man, it's it's not always easy. I think it it is very fulfilling in the end, but I know there are lots and lots of moments of doubt, you know, and and fear and that feeling that uh, you know that it, it's yeah you don't know enough and you're afraid of what you're stepping into. What has helped you over those spots when you have hit those rough spots? 
Boy, um, yeah, I've definitely hit those spots, you know, going out on my own, just kind of wondering, can I really help companies out there? I, I knew what I built in the past at my former company. I, I guess I turned into the subject matter expert on, on Power BI and introduced it to the company. And of course, there were people out there that knew more about it than me, but I was able to build something very useful and very powerful that saved a lot of time for a lot of people. So I think just carrying that thought forward into working with companies. Yeah, I, I think it's been kind of cool to see like, you know, some projects, there's definitely a learning curve. And um, thankfully, there's a lot of support and resources out there to get you over the hump or whatever. And, uh, but the cool thing is once you have that in your tool belt, it's just kind of a continual learning and, and you're able to help the next person with that same challenge. So that's definitely the learning curve has been highly accelerated over the past few years. And yeah, I think just the the thought to, there's so many people that I can help. Like there, there's a lot of people that are just getting started um, that are getting stuck with things that I got stuck with a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So this idea that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people fall into that trap where they feel like they need to feel good enough, right? Before they get started. But maybe, maybe the opposite is true. Maybe you're allowed to, learn on the journey, you know, not, not start at the expert, but start on the journey. And well, if not become an expert, they become better and better as you go along. And it sounds like certainly you've experienced that. Yeah, definitely. I think having talked to a few people, you know, Ian Bowman's one that comes to mind, I know he's, he's helped me just remember that, you know, um, it's okay to, to, to not know, like yeah. the, the world of Power BI is, is, pretty wide. I mean, it covers a lot of different pieces that I don't, I don't know if everyone's an expert on all of them, but um, I think I've, I've definitely come to the point where it's no problem to say, you know, I'm, I, I don't know how to do that particular piece and that's becoming less and less. And Love yeah. That. Love that. Yeah. I think it, it does take courage, but it's, it's sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's what wins you fans. Of course, I've heard John's story where that's why they signed him up, uh, you know, became their, his clients because they're like, oh God, we love the honesty, right? <laughs> you <know? laughs> You're straight up. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I guess that's a great note to end things on. I, it's certainly been such a joy and privilege for me to kind of watch your trajectory, see you take off, create that impact for you, your clients, and of course, for yourself, for your family and people around you. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. And thanks, uh, thanks for everything you do. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Hey folks, Avi here, back to share my biggest aha moment. And it only struck me the third or fourth time I listened to the interview. What struck me was how Greg and I were discussing that the folks in the specialty coffee industries are generally really passionate about their work. But then I also remembered my conversation with Josh, Greg's client, where he spoke about how he did love coffee and people. And best of all, sitting down and talking to people over a cup of coffee, that be his customers or clients or others. But how he wasn't quite able to do that because they had to work so hard in getting the reports and data prepared for these client meetings. And even then, lots of pieces were missing. And now with Power BI reports in hand, Josh can just sit down and focus on the conversation focus on what he loves doing the most. That is the biggest gift that Greg Berg or really any other Power BI consultant can give to this world. Give people the freedom to focus on doing what they love most, what is supposed to be their job and not have to worry about cleaning messy data or piecing data together from multiple sources. And the best part, Greg gets to do what he loves the most which is to play with Power BI to create reports and dashboards and help businesses like Clifton Coffee and others. That's what I call a true win-win. This is the Power On Podcast. I'm your host, Avi Singh. Carl Taladua is our executive editor. Make sure to share this podcast with your loved ones. I'll see you again in the next episode. Until then, Power On.